Well, good morning. It's really great to be here. And uh, what a great title uh, to be given, Adoption in the Bible. Let's, let's just jump in. It's, the theme is Adoption in the Bible. So turn to your Bibles, please, if you have one. There's some over here. The Bi- because the Bible is full of the imagery of adoption, sonship, fatherhood, motherhood, family. And we want to look at a couple of passages We're going to read from Romans and from James this morning, just a couple of verses. Romans 8, verses 12 to 17, first of all. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. So we've got a little phrase there in verse 15 that's saying to us that something God does when anyone becomes a Christian is described here as adoption as sons. We'll come back to Romans 8. Just flick over for a moment to James chapter 1 as well. Verses 26 and 27. James chapter 1. verses 26 and 27. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And the famous Christian author and preacher J.I. Packer once said that our understanding of Christianity cannot be better than our grasp of adoption. Our understanding of, of the Christian faith can't be better than our grasp of adoption. And so that makes this a massively important topic for us today. And I I know some of the people in the room, there are others I don't know that well. Some in this room may have been adopted. Some uh, of you have adopted or are close to adopting, about to adopt or considering adopting, or you might have seen closely others who've adopted. For some people, it's, it's, you'll know of a good experience. You'll know probably also of bad experiences. Today, we want to think of the most wonderful experience of adoption that can happen in anyone's life. If you're a Christian this morning, And if J.I. Packer was right when he said that, then we need to grasp what the Bible says about adoption so that we can really understand Christianity. If you're not a Christian, it's our prayer that what you know and see maybe in in the world and normal life of families adopting, that might point you to this great news in the Bible. And maybe for some today, God will will lay it on our hearts to, to adopt or to foster or to get involved in families in ways that we can help. So I want to notice this morning four points that our Bible shows to us about God adopting us into his family. Four points. First of all, adoption shows us rescue. Adoption shows us rescue. I don't know if there are any social workers here this morning, but if our social worker was here, I I might get in a bit of trouble for that title that first heading because we're not encouraged in adopting to think of ourselves as saviors. Uh, It's not as if Emma and I or anyone else, we are superheroes that ride to the rescue of, of a child. There are many children who aren't adopted and they have still some form of stable upbringing with foster carers or with someone else. So we're not saviors. But there is in some way a sense of rescue. I'm sure we've all heard of the extreme cases where children have been 
neglected or abandoned, and they, they do need rescue. There's not really any other word for it. And even in the less extreme cases, any time that a child is available for adoption, it's because of unsuitable circumstances at home that they need to come out of. And when the Bible talks about God adopting us, there's definitely a sense of rescue. We have a clue to it there in Romans 8, verse 15. Flick back to Romans 8, please. We'll come to James at the end, but Romans 8 is where we're starting. Verse 15 says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. So verse 15 is painting a picture of life before someone joins God's family. And look at the words that are used, slavery and fear. Now it's not the case for our daughters that they were living in slavery before they came to our family. But the Bible is clear, it is true that spiritually for you or me or anyone else, before We're adopted by God. We're slaves. The Bible tells us many times that without God, we are slaves to sin. We're slaves to the devil. We do what the devil wants. People who are not Christians often think they're doing what they want to do, but they're doing what the devil wants. They're slaves, and we can't set ourselves free. But God, when someone becomes a Christian, enters into that abusive and cruel situation and removes us and brings us into his own family where he is our father, and we have a loving father instead of an abusive slave driver. So adoption shows us rescue. The Bible's word is salvation or being saved. And We need to see and know and remember that every one of us needs this rescue. There's there's no human who's automatically part of God's family. Look at verse 7 of Romans 8. It uses the word hostile to describe us. By ourselves, naturally, we're hostile to God. We're enemies of God. And then jump ahead to verse 12. It begins the little chunk, the little section we're in today, verses 12 to 17. These are about the blessings that are for Christians. That says brothers. These blessings are for those who are in the family of God. They're not just for anyone and everyone. Naturally, you, I, anyone else, we're enemies of God. We're not children of God. But what adoption is about is someone who wasn't family being brought into the family. And the Bible teaches that's what you and I need. We need adopted because we're not automatically part of God's family. So that's our first one this morning. Adoption shows us rescue. Number two, adoption shows us relationship. Adoption shows us relationship. Christians are not just forgiven sinners. We can be forgiven by trusting in Jesus. We can be wiped clean. We can have our sins no longer counted against us. And that's wonderful, and that's amazing, but there's more. Not only can we stand before God the judge, not guilty of the wrong that we've done, but we can also come near God as Father, a Father who loves us and cares for us. For both of our girls, when their adoption was fully completed, we had a day in court to make it all official. Actually, yesterday was the the third anniversary of our youngest daughter's uh, official adoption day. In both cases, there was a judge there, but the judge kept it brief, uh, child-friendly. There were photos with the judge afterwards. We went out for dinner as a family. We made it a special day. We were celebrating that after many months, it was now official. Many months of the girls being with us, and many months before that of the whole long, drawn-out process as it can be. But take that picture then and think about what God does with us as Christians. 
It's like the judge in the courtroom formally declaring the adoption to be complete, to be finalized in the eyes of the law, and then the judge himself steps out from behind the bench and takes off the wig and gives us a hug, and he takes us out for dinner and spends the day with us because he's the one adopting us. Adoption shows us relationship. Relationship. Look at verse 15 again of Romans 8. There's a really beautiful, thrilling little phrase here. It says that you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now, depending on your age and your interests, you might hear Abba and, and think straight away of a, well, it was a 1970s Swedish pop group. But Abba, in the language of the New Testament times, it, it means daddy or dada in a very simple word a word a child could say and would have said but it's teaching deep deep truths this word is about the closeness of our relationship with God when we're Christians you see in New Testament times and this is the case for many people today as well fathers were treated with great respect and rightly so the Bible tells us we're to honor father and mother. But for New Testament dads, that could easily have been a kind of a sternness, a distant, distance from their children, not really being very warm. And Romans doesn't want us to have that picture of a father. It says Christians cry, Abba. It's the way a child shouts out, Daddy, and she just jumps and expects the dad to catch her in his arms. And she doesn't care in that moment who else is watching or what anybody else thinks. She's trusting him and loving him. And that's the, the closeness here that we have as Christians. We're not only forgiven. That's, that's awesome. We don't deserve that. That's spectacular and stunning and, and wondrous good news. But we're not only forgiven. We get to call God Daddy or Father. And there's more in this little word, Abba. Simple word, but such a special word. If you look back in your Bibles to Mark chapter 14, verse 36, you can read there about Jesus on the night that he was betrayed and arrested and was to be taken off for his crucifixion. And Jesus prays, Abba, Father. And then Romans says that that's what we say as Christians. So as Christians, we share in what Jesus himself has with God. Abba, or Father, or Daddy, is what Jesus called God. You can read it in Mark 14. So through adoption, we share in what Jesus has with God. Does that not blow your mind today? Does that not excite your hearts if you're Christians? Adoption shows us relationship. Before any of us are Christians, the Bible calls us sons of disobedience, children of wrath, Ephesians 2. But then because of God's great love, he brings us into his family. And we belong in his family. He's our perfect father. We're his precious children. And no wonder John in the New Testament invites us to gaze open mouthed at such spectacular news. How great is the love the father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that's what we are. John says, 1 John 3 verse 1, this is the glorious good news of the Bible. And to be in God's family, to be that close to God, is all the more breathtaking when we remind ourselves that we were rebels and haters and enemies of God. In 1948, a band of communists briefly seized control of the town of Sun Chun in Korea. They executed the two eldest sons of Pastor Yang Won's son, his two oldest boys, Matthew and John. These teenage boys died as martyrs 
calling on their persecutors to have faith in Jesus. Sometime later, when the communists were driven out, one young man of the village, Chai Sun, was identified as the one who had fired the lethal gunshots, and his execution was ordered. Amazingly, Pastor Sun asked for the charges to be dropped. More amazingly, the pastor asked for Chai Sun to be released into his custody for adoption. His daughter Rachel, the 13-year-old sister of the murdered boys, a 13-year-old girl, testified to support her dad's incredible request. And only then did the court agree to release Chai's son, and he became the son of the pastor. And he became, in time, a believer in the grace of Jesus. The vicious enemy became a beloved son. And that is exactly what God offers to us when he adopts us. We probably think we're quite nice. <laughs> It'd be nice for God to have us in his family. I know if you see my daughters this morning, you will straight away think they are beautiful and wonderful. And they are. And you'll think, who wouldn't want to adopt them? And you'd be right. But we probably think that about ourselves as well. I'm not so bad. Who wouldn't want to have me in their family? We're Chai son. We murdered God's son. The Bible says Jesus was wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. It was our sin and rejection that nailed him to the cross. We are all God's enemies, but he offers to adopt us into his family. Adoption shows us relationship. Number three, adoption shows us rights. Adoption shows us rights. Now, straight away, we might be a little bit nervous here as Christians. We, we don't always like to talk about or hear about rights sometimes. We're, we, well, we, we, rights are okay in a sense, but we feel like we live in a world sometimes where all people talk about is rights and maybe not too much responsibilities. But through adoption, we have rights. It's okay to say that. That's biblical. That's true. John 1, 9. To all who did receive him, Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And our daughters have all the rights and privileges of being part of our family. And all the rights and privileges of being part of the the wider Lockridge and Stevens family circles, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, everybody. So if, if it's Peter and Emma's tradition that on Sunday mornings we have bagels and croissants, then our girls get bagels and croissants. If Peter and Emma plan a holiday to Disneyland, our girls come to Disneyland. If uncles, aunts, and grandparents are buying presents for the children in the family circle, our girls get a present with everyone else. They're part of the family and they get all the perks. Now go along with that. It's the same as a Christian. In adopting us, God gives us all the rights and freedoms and privileges of sons and daughters. One American pastor who adopted, he and his wife were told by the judge after they'd signed the official papers, Brian and Ariel, you must understand that Alex is no longer your foster son. He is not even your adopted son. He is simply your son. He is entitled to all the benefits and affection and legal rights as if born your son. And the judge turned to Ashley and Zach, their biological sons, and said, Alex is not your foster brother. Nor is he your adopted brother. He's simply your little brother. Adoption shows us rights. And there are so many. I can't, this is where I, I need to watch my time this morning. I can't, we can't go into all the rights and all the privileges of being in the family of God today. But our passage, Romans 8, highlights one, at least one in particular. Verse 17, it says, And if 
If we're children of God, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Lots of families in Bible times and today, they leave something for the, the next generation. They leave something to their children. We call it an inheritance. It might be the house, it might be money, it might be a precious piece of family, jewelry or whatever. And verse 17 is saying that when we belong to God's family, we become heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Now again, there's so much <laughs> crammed into that idea of inheritance, but what can we t understand from that today? An inheritance, even, even in our world, is usually something you're waiting for, something you're looking ahead to, something in the future. And part of what awaits us, part of our inheritance, what's ahead of us in our future as Christians is heaven. Perfect peace and joy forever in the family of God. In the presence of God forever. No more hurt from the enemies of God. And when a child is adopted in our families or our world or our friendship circles, you'll hear the language of their forever home. That's what God offers to all of his adopted sons and daughters. A forever home. Adoption shows us rights. And then our fourth one is that adoption shows us resemblance. Adoption shows us resemblance. It, it always makes Emma and I smile because people who, who don't know our girl's story and don't know that they're adopted, well, and especially when they were younger, they'll still now they'll say things to us like, oh, she's so like her mummy, or she looks so like so-and-so, and it's fine, we just smile and, and accept that. In some cases they're right, and actually in lots of other ways, we can see that, that, that they are, there is a resemblance, they are like us, even though there's no genetic connection. Both of them can do a really impressive Northern Irish accent, even though they have never lived there. In both girls, we can see little mannerisms, little habits, similarities, maybe even quirks and, and sinfulness and things that, that really it's, it's Emma or me that we're seeing. That's what James 1 is really about. So turn to James 1. We're going to finish with this passage. James 1, 26 and 27. James has been saying in verse 22 that... If God's word is not continually impacting us as Christians, then you're not the real deal. If God's word is not constantly affecting us as Christians, then we're not the real thing. And so now in verses 26 and 27, he gives three real life examples of what hearing and doing looks like. And they're not random examples. Go back into the chapter, verse 18, James has highlighted God's true and life-giving words. Also, verse 18, he's shown God stepping in to take action for people who are in need, us and our need and our sin. Verse 17, he's spoken of God as the father of lights and one who never changes. He's pure, he's perfect. And verse 21 has spoken of how we're to put away wickedness and filthiness. Basically, the, this section is saying that our responses to God and his word are hearing and then doing. It should reflect him. There should be a family likeness. There should be a resemblance. There should be ways in which we, as his family, act like our Father. That's what verse 27 even spells it out. God the Father. And three ways that he highlights here, three ways for us to hear God's word and do God's word, three ways for us to be like our Father, live out our family likeness, in verses 26 and 27, are controlled speech and clean character and compassion for the needy. And I hope for obvious reasons, I'm going to focus on the final one of those this morning, verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. 
and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now interestingly, part of how many Christians keep the end of verse 27, the keeping themselves unstained bit, is not to become too involved in the messiness of the sinful world that's all around us. Keep the world kind of at arm's length, the world out there, the sinful fallen world. That can't be what verse 27 is talking about in the second half of the verse because the first half of the verse talks about a very hands-on involvement. Visit orphans and widows in their affliction or in their trouble. And that word visit, we'll see in a moment, is a loaded word in the Bible. It's tied in with how God acts towards us, especially in the coming of Jesus. Jesus didn't stay at a safe distance from us. He did stay pure and unstained, but he came and got involved and took our mess upon himself. So let's be clear, we can't be the Savior, but we can reflect our Father by helping the needy. And God's people all through our Bibles, Old Testament and New, are commanded to reflect God's compassion with a special concern for the helpless and going out of their way for the widow and the orphan. In Bible times, if you had no husband and no, or no parents, you had no protection and no providing. There was no benefit system in their day. There was no government support. And so the orphan and the widow kind of is an umbrella term for anyone who's needy and vulnerable. There's a broad way in which verse 27 is saying to us to help anyone who's in need. It could be disabled people, it could be homeless people, immigrants, it could be the starving in our own country or far away. It's broad, verse 27, about the needy, but it also does specifically mention widows and orphans. Let's dig deeper into verse 27, this word visit. It's more than just going to see them. Although that, that, that's a good thing to do, and I think especially with the widow, that, that's a lovely thing to do practically. The Bible's meaning, the Bible's usage of the word visit is much richer and much deeper than just popping in with them now and again. Visit in the Bible means to come to someone's help to come to the rescue. And I could, could give you tons of examples of that. We'll not flick through them all in our Bibles today. Genesis 50, Exodus 4, Luke 1, Luke 7, Acts 15. It's a huge word in a biblical sense and it's rich with thoughts of rescue. Over and over again, it means taking responsibility, getting involved, giving ourselves, not just Throwing money at a problem, although we, we can give generously. Not even only praying, although of course prayer is important. But this word and this theme of visiting means taking the burdens of the vulnerable and bringing them to us. So how do we do this for orphans, for children whose parents are dead or who've been abandoned or neglected? Of course, James is saying here we're to care for both orphans and widows. But the love will look different because the need is different. Many widows today won't die if you don't take them in. The orphans might. The widow still needs our care. And we do need to think about that in our churches. I'm not here to speak about that today, so I'm, I'm kind of leaving that side of the verse a little bit. They still need our care, but the widow today is much less defenseless than she was in Bible times. The widow can't be brought into God's covenant in the same way that an adopted child can. Think about that. As Christians, to adopt a child is not only giving them a comfortable and safe home, 
It's not only giving them limitless opportunities to learn about Jesus and to see the Christian life modeled in our families and in our churches, but much more than that, we bring children into the covenant people and the covenant community of God. And he promises to put his name on our children if we're Christians. And there's no there's no distinction in the Bible. Well, it's to know that's only for your birth children. It's not for adopted children. No, it's the children of believers. And he'll put his name on them. And so for that reason and for the fact that, for those reasons, for the fact that this is a conference on adoption, I want to focus on the orphan of verse 27 more than the widow today. <laughs> The Bible is full of examples of God's grace flowing through families, but also many, many, many examples, even in our Bibles, of how that works in along family lines that are not normal. Family circumstances that are not normal in their day. <coughs> and look who's writing this letter. James <coughs> knows all about that. And James knew more about it than most. His dad was Joseph of Nazareth. And Joseph took into his family a son who was not biologically descended from him. Jesus. And yet Joseph of Nazareth, James' dad, the man writing chapter 1 for us, Joseph of Nazareth, was fully and completely Jesus' earthly dad. One writer says, if Joseph is not really the father of Jesus, then you and I are going to hell. Jesus' identity as the Christ is tied into his identity as a descendant of David, and that human identity came to Jesus through adoption, through Joseph. So James, the man writing this verse in chapter 1, knows all of that. He'd shared his home. He'd shared his dad with Jesus. And so James now writes about us being like, not his dad, but the perfect father in heaven. So I wonder what our orphan care could look like in our families and in our churches. Could it look like adoption? Could it look like fostering? Will it be heavily investing in needy and broken families? We can't say that we don't feel called to adopt or foster or invest in vulnerable children as if it's for the elite or for the select few. James 1, if it's open in front of you today, it's calling you to it. And I haven't just picked a random Bible passage that fits the topic I've been given. Deuteronomy 10, verse 18, Job 29, 12, Isaiah 1, 17 and 23, Hosea 14, 3, many Psalms, a whole host of other Bible passages call us to this, to orphan care. Imagine what a difference it would make to our nation if the church really went for this. These figures are a few years old, uh, but they're, they're, they're pretty accurate even still today. But bear with me for the illustration. In Scotland in 2018, there were 14,738 children in the care of their local authority. 57% of them returned home to their parents. Only 7% of those were adopted. So that leaves 5,305 children in just that one year who were in foster care, secure units, homeless, or in temporary accommodation. 5,305 children in one year. That number by itself is powerful enough. But let's go push a bit further. The Scottish Church Census of 2016 showed roughly, just let's deal in round numbers here, about 1,800 evangelical or reformed churches in Scotland. Churches where we could be hopeful, confident that, that there's a minister there who believes the Bible and where you, hear, you would hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's say 5,400 children, 1,800 solid churches. If three children were adopted per year, or per church in Scotland, there would be no children in care. If three children were adopted, and, and some, some of those churches are <laughs> huge, not huge, but, but bigger than our churches maybe. Three per church in Scotland, there'd be no children in care. 
So think today, please. Pray for yourselves and for others. What does it look like for you, your family, your church? All of us are at different stages of life. We are, there are different circumstances. We're not all the same. Emma will, will touch on this as well in her talk. But what, what does it mean for you? These, these stunning gospel truths of rescue and relationship and rights. What, what do they mean for you and me? How are we going to James 1? How are we going to hear and do? How are we going to live out the family resemblance? Will we adopt or foster? Uh, would it be respite fostering? Uh, will you do it part-time to give carers a break? There's an organ I don't know the Stranraer locality that well. There's an organisation in Edinburgh called Room For You where you can take in teenage mums and their babies. There'll be children in our congregations and in our, in our circles who have uh, extra needs and you could help them with maybe by, by babysitting or by cooking a meal or whatever it would be. Let me finish with this. There was a, a few years ago I was going to preach on James chapter 1 and I, I saw an article on the Desiring God website and it was about these verses and it, it mentioned orphans in the, in the title and I thought great, this is going to tell everybody they have to adopt. And I read the article, and it was a good article, but it didn't, didn't tell everyone to adopt it. It had these great opening lines. Orphan care is far bigger than adoption. If the church is going to care for the fatherless, we eventually will find our way upstream into broken families to fight sin at the headwaters. And I, I think that's a brilliant picture because it fits with James here. Verse 27 is talking about pollution when it uses the word unstained. And so those writers of that blog post in their picture, they're saying you could, you could look at adoption as rescuing a fish out of the polluted river. And we can give that fish a fresh living environment and that's good and that's important and that's necessary. But their point was that Christians need to get upstream as well. What's causing the problems up there? Get involved with families before the pollution and the brokenness of sin ends up with the children in care, with the children basically orphaned. Be a presence and a voice for the gospel and for peace and for reconciliation and for repentance and for grace in the needy and the vulnerable families in your community and in your church. And as you do that, you're showing the family likeness, the resemblance with our perfect Father in heaven who has adopted you if you're a Christian, who's given you rescue, rights, and relationship. Amen.